Yeah. Wait on the IT part. Uh, Vic is trying to get logged in and see if Vicky is ready to go. Oh, I got you. Needs to be moved over from his TVs. <laughs> I saw Carl back around the retirement. I know, I saw him too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. Why is that name from? She was uh, Tom Curran's assistant. That's right. That name was so familiar. Yeah, that's right. Now I do remember. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so yesterday afternoon, Jim Kinney resigned from the board. Uh, as such, the board has no chair and no current vice chair. As secretary, as secretary to the board and uh, remaining officer, I will conduct the meeting today. And so we'll call the meeting to order with roll call. Brian Hanson. Present. Paul Ample. Present. Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Lohr. Here. Jody Patterson. Here. Anthony Waskowitz. Here. Milton Wilkins. Here. All right. And Paul, welcome. New, new to the board. First meeting. Uh, a uh, wealth of experience with boards and commissions. Look forward to getting to know you better and working with you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will first order business uh, approval of minutes. Section 2, uh, item A, retirement board meeting of August 29th, 2023. <coughs> All in favor? All right, was there, is there a motion to approve? Oh. Section three, uh, request for benefits, item A, uh, employees requesting retirement benefits. There are 20 civilian requests. Motion to approve. Sorry. Anything Linda. unusual? Okay. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? All right. Uh, A2, two police requests. Becky, anything? No, nothing unusual. Okay, I okay. move. Let's go. All right. All in favor? Motion to approve. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Any objections? Section B, corrected retirement benefit requiring board approval. Uh, there's one civilian request. This is a request. Um, would we do pensionable pay and factor that all in? When I did this back in, uh, I think it was May for this um, employee retiree, I did not include longevity pay. And so I went back and recalculated it um, and, and got it updated. It wasn't anything substantial, but, you know, to be fair to the, the retiree and, um, you know, 
make it official. We'll need board approval for that. So my apologies. Okay. I move to approve. Second. In favor? Aye. Aye. Objections? Item C beneficiaries applications for death benefits. Uh, there were four civilian requests. Move to approve. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? Item four, a discussion of board vice chair position. Up to the board, but maybe consider tabling until uh, another meeting. I suggest, I suggest we just table until the next meeting. What's going to change at the next meeting? We not have the discussion now. I think part of it might be uh, finding a chair, which you might want to do at the next meeting. Gotcha. Okay. You want to discuss it at all, Jeremy? Let's see. So, uh, uh, Phineas, uh, performance report, ACG Consulting Group. Got items five through nine. Like, yeah, I got a lot of them today, so I feel sorry for you guys. But, uh, <laughs> no, it'll be good. What, what we have today is first off, just you know, typical market review performance update through August 31st. I'm going to start with that and go through that. And then we do have two items. Um, as a reminder, we do these annually. First is just kind of review of overall active asset implementation. Um, certainly, it affects our managers and how we think about selecting managers. But it's really just a tremendous amount of, of data from the industry. So I'll go through that. Also, have um, just every year we look at our investment policy statements, see if there's anything we can clean up, language we can change. And so we do have just a few quick tweaks, but really nothing um, uh, really of, of substance too much. And then finally, just there was a, a little follow up from last month, just around concentration in the large cap uh, equity universe, particularly the SP 500. You know, seven names were driving that. So, what's our exposure there? So, that's what I plan to cover as we go through this. And first, I will start with just our portfolio. So, it's um, it's a staple piece that says market update and portfolio review. So, as we start with that, so really, now this is we, we talked quite a bit about the markets this year, and, and we know kind of generally what's happened. Again, really, everything has been uh, market sentiment has been driven by movements in the interest rates. And so, kind of here on this first page right here, this is just a, again a summation of the market performance. And you can see, really, I'd focus on kind of this um, kind of table right here on the left hand side in the middle, just index returns. Um, but again, you know, 2022, certainly we know um, the uncertainty around the real sharp raise in interest rates, kind of the Fed has been out there saying, listen, we are here to bring down inflation. We're going to do what it takes. Uh, and so, saw a lot of that kind of really hurt both equity and bond markets last year. This year, we started to see certainly some of the Fed, um, some of those rises in interest rates, we've kind of seen that kind of play out in some of the economic news starting to help people be a little bit more confident. Not need to be as aggressive in rate hikes this year. Um, so markets really have rebounded tremendously, and you see that. That's just that right-hand side of this graph, the light blue bars. You can see really across the board, uh, bonds are positive, but really strong jumps in equity market performance so far this year. We did see a little bit of pullback, and that's that dark blue bars on the left-hand side. August um, to the negative side, and we started to see that continue here in September. Um, and really, a lot of it has to do with you know, can Jerome Powell, the Fed, continue to come out and say, listen, inflation, it's not where we want it to be. We continue to want to um, you know, continue to raise interest rates, make it more expensive to borrow, harder for folks to spend money, you know, kind of even push us towards this recession if need be. So overall, we've seen a pullback uh, really in the last month or two, but continuing you know, you know, take a longer term approach, past just the last six weeks, overall 23 will continue to be very strong. Uh, market performance, something we've seen in our performance report. And so just to hop to the numbers, and I do want to make one point out here. If you look to page four, so these are, uh, this is our portfolio as of August 31st. So first and foremost, $820 million in the portfolio. That's in the top left-hand side of the page. 
and we'll go through the returns in a minute that got us there. But I do want to point out, uh, you know, and again, as always, we compare ourselves every month to our asset allocation. And on the right hand side of this page is over and under targets. And you can see this looks quite a bit different than it usually does. You know, typically we're, you know, we always try to be within plus or minus 5% uh, for various asset classes. You can see underweight fixed income by quite a bit, but then there's that corresponding overweight to cash. Um, and again, this had to do with that transition from Silchester. We kind of went through that calendar with the board and everything. And so ultimately at the end of the day, we pulled, we had some liquidity with Western that we pulled out. Our Standardson money went to cash, and then we quickly turned around and funded that back to Silchester. So everything has taken place. If you were to look at this as of today, uh, we'd, be, we'd be well within our bands, and we've moved on from Sanderson and funded Silchester as of the start of this month. But again, we kind of we had talked about this. We knew it would cross over a month end, and just so um, everyone kind of knows right now. Um, just a quick question. It looks like the two areas on the previous page, page three, that you have rated as overvalued are large, large cap, U.S. large cap, and real estate. Those look like our two largest overweights. Is there any rebalancing we should be doing or? So we continue to wait on money from Reef in our, in our real estate portfolio. Again, they put the queue up to pull some money on. So we've put a $20 million um, redemption in and we've gotten seven back so far. So we still expect some of that to come back. Um, and then as far as US large cap goes, this continues to be our funding source. So every month we, you know, we're talking with Vicky and we're pulling out two, three million dollars in the portfolio. And we continue to use it, whether it's from Runline, particularly Jenison a lot this year, given how much they've kind of ramped up. Um, and so ultimately we do continue to think, listen, it's a very frothy, expensive space, and that's why we're looking to take some of our profits there. Um, we don't necessarily think it's at a level where we need to kind of make a tremendous rebalance too, but we can just so you know, we've pulled. I mean, we're taking two, three million, like I said, out each month. We've done that pretty much all year. And so continue to, to try to pull that back in line. Okay. Any other questions just got overall asset allocation and then we'll flip to page five as it looks at performance. Okay. So again, we saw a little bit of pullback in the markets in the month of August, and that's that one month column. And so you can see we're down uh, 2%, pretty much right in line with our benchmark there. But you can see definitely different stories. You look to the column to the right year to date. So this is through the first eight months of the year. Um, you can see we're up 8%. And again, just you know, for Paul and others who are new, everything we're showing is, is net of all investment manager fees. This is returns after the fees we pay. So we're up 8%. And we compare ourselves to two different benchmarks. The first is our strategic policy index. And so really, if you look at the, the previous page, Paul, what our target asset allocation is, that's 63 equity, 22 fixed income, 15 real estate. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what our strategic policy is made up of. 63 equity, 22 core four plus bonds, Barclays Ag, and 15 to the Odyssey, the real estate index. Now, the, so you can see year to date, we're slightly above that from a net of fee perspective, up 8%. Uh, the broad policy index, again, basically, if you look at that previous page four, it's really just simply moving real estate over to equities. So there's no real estate within um, within our broad policy index. Real estate has taken a hit so far this year, really protected us last year. Great diversifier for the portfolio. But again, it's really still got some of the reasons, the impact, the interest rates, certainly a lot of borrowing in this space. Uh, to, to Brian's point, why we think it's a little bit overvalued, that's certainly come down this year. And so, but that's not in our broad policy index, and so that's why we trail there. But we would expect that, no major concerns. Uh, just looking a little bit longer term, so for the year, again, this includes really kind of the last four months of 2022 that continue to be part of the downturn, particularly in September and a little bit into October. So that's why our returns a little bit less. We're slightly behind our policy index. You go off further to the five year, you know, certainly we had 2022 in there. We had 2020 and COVID, um, even part of 2018, which ended to be a pretty volatile year. But overall, kind of, you can see we're up just about almost 5.9% over the five year. So just right on top of a little bit ahead of our policy index. And then over the last 10 years, we're up almost 7.4%, 7.36. And that's a 30 basis points per year outperformance versus our strategic policy index. So. Um, long term continued strong performance. Any next question? Yeah, no. Uh, the real estate uh, performance uh, year to date 5.21%. That is through what period? 
Uh, this should include, let me just pull it up. So this is through uh, the quarter end. So this would be through June 30th. So it's really outdated. Yeah. It just was in that um, that also that's the same thing for the Odyssey as well, which reports quarterly as well. So yeah. there's somewhat of a lag there. Yeah. Can you remind me the duration on IRM and Western? Uh, I'd have to double check on that for you, Brian. Um, we had Western present earlier in the year and they were kind of long duration. So they are. And I think they still are. Um, so I don't know. It's probably going to be an ugly September, too. Yeah, so they've certainly kind of Western, as you can see, have, has been impacted. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly last year, twenty two was a pretty tough year for them, and that's what's really kind of driven there. If you look at that three year number for them on on page seven, uh, that longer duration certainly kind of hurt them relative to the benchmark. But again, that's kind of somewhat their mo, and they've you know continued to load up on yield. And well, but that, that was that was also probably what got them into the uh, Credit Suisse AT one. Yeah, it's, they had that exposure. That's right. We, we went through that. Yeah. Maybe just a couple other points on really kind of what's driving some performance. And um, you know, I think one of the, one of the benefits of, of having these paper copies, you're making comments beforehand, it's a little bit easier to just flip back and forth. And so I don't want to make people flip too much, but I'm going to focus on the year to date column again. So this is 2023 uh, performance overall. And just on page five, you know, hitting some of these kind of composites again, as we want to think about this individual manager is very much important, but it's how they work together uh, relative to what else we have. So obviously kind of very strong uh, performance rebound here, particularly in US large cap. Again, really led by, led by growth sectors, technology. You can see our three managers in aggregate up over 20 and a half percent. So you can see that's almost 2% ahead of the benchmark so far for the past eight months. So strong performance. Really, you know, that's led, you know, Jenison, the manager of ours, who really kind of overweights technology. And we're going to show that here in a minute. We have this kind of breakdown of their holdings relative to the benchmark. Uh, but you can see if you flip to page six, again, Aristotle definitely having a nice rebound on the value space uh, relative to the, to the Russell 1000 value, up about 3.5% year to date. But you can see Jenison up almost 39% year to date. Again, that just shows some of that divergence and that difference in the growth sector versus value so far this year. And so you can see that's not only is growth done well, but Jenison, as we'll see, overweight some of these you know, names who have really rebounded this year. So adding some strong performance um, overall, about 6%. Um, you don't necessarily need to flip back, but just our, our two small cap managers, Ernest and Granite, you can see them here on page six. But just so you know, in aggregate, year to date, they're up about 7%. That's a little bit less than the benchmark. But over the last 12 months, they're up over 2% relative to the, uh, in aggregate, relative to the Russell 2000. And so you can see Ernest, you really kind of right on top of its benchmark this year. Granite trailed a little bit so far this year, but you can look over the past, the last four months of last year, the past 12 months, and you can see some strong outperformance from Granite. And really both these managers in general, and you look to the longer term since we've added them, really been able to add quite a bit of uh, outperformance as we would expect. Uh, Sanderson gave us a nice parting gift. You can see again, we are out of them as of August 31st in the portfolio, but through 831 for the last eight months, uh, you can see they're up almost 20%. So really kind of a strong rebound. And then they talked a lot about it. And again, as a reminder, we talked a lot about it. actually from their philosophy and process, we didn't have much of an issue with what Sanderson was. It was more so from the firm standpoint, qualitatively, they continue to lose a lot of assets. Um, they wound down, yeah. Would you say, Bill? No? Have they completely wound down here? So they, uh, yes, they have. So everybody's out as of August 31st. Um, and again, I think it's just, you know, it's a great reminder why, you know, we, we look at the qualitative issues, why that's so important. You know, we started talking about this months ago, and it takes us time to find, you know, new manager and kind of make that change. But again, Sanderson was getting so many clients redeeming, they end up shutting down their fund as of August 31st. We talked a little bit about that last month. So again, we were able to, when that happened, we already had a suitor in mind and we knew where that money was going. And again, starting next month, we won't see Sanderson anymore. We'll see Silchester on the stock index. So, but again, so, so not only Sanderson's strong performance, but then WCM, uh, you can see continued this year. Again, they have a little bit more of a growth tilt uh, in their portfolio. On the international side, that, that uh, factor has been more muted this year in terms of impacting. But overall, WCM continued to, to add some strong performance for us. 
Uh, Madrid, so we've talked to Madrid, and I, you know, I told you we've been in their offices in London. They've been over here. They are actually coming in person to our meeting next month in October. So we're going to continue to talk to them again. They have very much a quality focus. It's a little bit valuation, but much more quality in their portfolio, which on the international small cap side just really hasn't worked so far over the last couple of years. And so they've been out of favor. So they continue to, to kind of stick with their guns. They're still invested in the same philosophy and process. But we're going to bring them in here with them to kind of talk to everyone. Um, again, that'll be next month. They'll be here in person, PM team. Um, Acadian on the uh, emerging market side, you know, emerging markets, you know, itself have been, uh, I'd say overall, the, the different areas have been strong so far this year. China has struggled. And we've seen what we've seen Acadian been, you know, pretty good underweight to China. That's really helped their relative performance. And you can see the year that they really strong um, outperformance. Uh, both our bond managers, positive returns so far this year. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I, I think we'll see IR and M tends to be a little bit shorter than the benchmarks. So actually, I, I think they'll probably hold in better through September, but Western we'll see um, from an outperformance perspective. And then finally, you can see year to date, just look at that column again. That's just through the first half of the year. As we've mentioned, real estate, you know, some of its valuation, some kind of interest rates have, have hurt over the past uh, you know, six months. You can see overall, our managers have held in pretty well. But again, I want to point out it's been a tough, you know, year to date, one year, but that three year number, all of our managers up seven and a half to 10%. So again, that just goes to the strong performance they gave us in 21 uh, 22 as well. I'll make an observation. Yeah. Just to keep perspective on the, on the numbers. At the end of 2021, the portfolio approximated 966 million. $57,000. At the end of 2022, it was $760 million. It declined $205 million in 12 months. Now we're back to 820, um, $820, $665,000. So we were, we were down 21% last year versus 2021. And now we're only down about 15% versus 2021. And we're still in the hole versus where we were in 2021. We're in 2021, yes. Now, again, you can also look at that. And I don't, we, we have these in our quarterly books, as you guys know, but if you look at the first quarter of 20, so again, that was kind of before that big rebound in 20 and then into 21, we were kind of down even further from there. And even uh, exactly right that they said, about, but keep in mind, too, we're still pulling money out of this business. You know, each and kind of every month. So that's no, also nevertheless, the, the dollar value, I'm not talking about percentage so much, Dollar value has declined 15% over this period of time, whether it's performance or withdrawals. And that dollar value affects our funded ratio. Funded ratio went from 85% on a market value basis down to 65% at the end of last year. Now I think it's at 69 to 70%. It's and, still way under four. And I just point out, even though that we've we've had um, the risk-free rate raise anywhere from three to 500 basis points, depending on whether you're looking short or long. Yep. Our discount rate has stayed the same throughout. So the value of government obligations has declined dramatically. We'll see that next month when we're seeing the fixed income managers, but we have not adjusted our valuation metric at all. Well, we'll do that uh, in May or June, actually. I think June is our usual time table. Maybe May. Because then we get uh, the actuarial report in July. So what we're doing. Is that just an annual vote? No, no. Just kind of like an annual vote. Yes. And uh, Tony, I'm, maybe you weren't here the last time I perhaps not. What we do, uh, what ACG does is provide us with their best thinking on asset projected asset price returns and the structure of our portfolio. But I also get um, Morgan Stanley's asset class returns mm -hmm. as well as um, Morgan Stanley and oh, that's very long. What's that? and uh, Mercer. And so we look at all three plus or plus ACGs to try to come up with a reasonable expectation. Not saying anyone is particular, any company or firm 
is definitively right and another firm is definitively wrong. But just to understand the range of opinion or judgment analysis of three to four outstanding firms, just to test the reasonableness of our ongoing projection of sales for our portfolio given our asset mix. Okay, thank you. Hey, question on performance. I did maybe quickly we transition the uh, again stable piece to large cap equity discussion. This was a follow up from last month. Uh, and certainly, I think very timely, and, and I think it hits on first up just um, what's going on in the marketplace, but also diversification amongst our managers. And so, if you want to just flip, it's, it's page three. Is the first one. And so. We've, we've talked a lot about this. If you heard the headlines, you know, now it's the, the magnificent seven. You know, we keep seeing you know, all these different phrases for um, different investment uh, acronyms and groups. But this is, and it's the companies you see here on this page it's Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, which is Google, Nvidia, Tesla, Meta, which is Facebook. So, again, these kind of very strong you know, technology, some are different sectors, but, but technology companies. Who just who experienced tremendous growth really over the last several years, but even in particular here in 2023. We talked about this uh, earlier, I think last month. So year to date, the S&P 500 is up about 20%, and over 10 of that percent is attributed just to these seven stocks, and the other, you know, it's, it's almost 10% now is, is coming um, from the other, you know, 493. And so what kind of important distinction to make to you guys when we talk about uh, the SP 500 being a, a market cap weighted index. What that means is, so this is the benchmark, it's the SP 500. It's the largest 500 companies in the US, but they're all not weighted equally in that index to come up with their return. They're based on their overall size. And again, when you think about the size of a company, really it's, it's, it's simply quite their value is their share price times how many shares are outstanding. That's how much the company is worth. Um, and, it, and really, it speaks kind of its impact on the economy. Well, the SP 500 is, is weighted by how big the company is relative to each other. And so that's where this SP 500 line, these seven different companies, this is their weight within that index. So Apple is the largest. The SP 500, it's almost 8% of the index. And so you can see in total, it comes over 25%, 27.7%. Of the benchmark. Um, and so, kind of the question is, all right, well, how are we allocated to that? How do we compare? And these are our three managers. So, first off, rum line, passive, core in the middle, not surprisingly, as we wanted to, it matches the index. When we sign up for rum line, we're signing for passive exposure, index exposure. Aristotle's on the value side of that spectrum for us, you can see actually has very little exposure to these seven. You know, it has uh, an allocation of Microsoft and actually less than the overall SP 500 does. Conversely, we talked about Jenison in there. Jenison has been this manager at times. It's had really, really great returns for us and sometimes really poor returns. And that's because their focus, again, is what they call these ultra growth large technology weights. And you can see pretty much across the board here, um, not only have exposure to each of these, but pretty significant overweights, particularly if you're in NVIDIA, Tesla. Uh, relative to what's in the benchmark. So in aggregate, almost half of their portfolio, 41%, is allocated to these large seven names. So again, but this is why we have diversification in our portfolio. You know, it's, Genesis has been great for this year. We just highlighted that before, almost 40% in eight months, six, 7% ahead of the benchmark. Uh, but you bring these three together, and in aggregate, it's 25% of our large cap portfolio. So those three managers, in these seven stocks. So relative to the SP 500, we're a little bit over under uh, relative to what's there. Now, from our total portfolio perspective, so all of that $820 million that we were just referencing, uh, it's just about 7% of our portfolio is in those seven different companies. And so again, that just has to do with the US large cap space, one of the largest, most liquid areas in the world. These are the largest companies that we invest in. Um, and so that's kind of certainly what um, our exposure is. The question is, is it, are we happy with this exposure? And I think kind of first and foremost, this in some ways is what the market is. We sign up for broad market exposure, particularly obviously with Rumline, but we also with, with our active managers um, and kind of, you know, to, to be invested with what's driving investment market returns. Now, one thing we did put together, which is a comparison, it's on the next page, page four. 
is some of the differences. So think about again the S and P 500. What I said this market cap weighted index. So again, it's the biggest players have the biggest size in that index. You can invest conversely in an equal weighted index, and that's just simply taking this is the S and P 500 equal weight, taking the 500 largest companies, and everyone is the exact same size within the index. And frankly, someone need a crystal ball to to see who's going to you know do better in each individual year. And I can, you know, certainly it was particularly starting in 2015, really 2017 pound forward. We've seen really strong outperformance from these, you know, large cap, uh, heavily dominated in the mark cap index. And that does, we don't have year to date 23 on here, but certainly that'll be another year drive. Um, and so again, and actually what you end up finding in our equal weight index, and this speaks to the diversification of the overall portfolio, you get to some of the smaller mid cap, names in the portfolio, which we're getting exposure to through our earners and through our granite um, as well. So overall, we're, we're comfortable with this exposure, it, you know, kind of in itself in a vacuum, it seems a lot that we have just, you know, seven names with, with this amount of um, exposure in our portfolio. But overall, that's just kind of how the market has, has, has gotten. It's been really driven by some of these larger mega tech, tech mega cap names continuing to grow. Uh, but overall, we're not as exposed as the S&P 500 is. Uh, but we're also certainly through the benchmarks, we can appreciate and grow with that. And also why we diversify within our managers to the H3 and the plant different. What are fees on the equal weighted um, passive products? Are they similar to the? They're the similar. Different? I can check. They're, they're like well, a couple basis points more. They're, they're, they're very similar to, um, like, you know, we're able to like through like an, uh, a Northern Trust or State Street, for instance. Yeah. Um, has these, and we can, you know, you can get large cap for one or two basis points. Equal weight would be under five basis points. Okay. I'm just wondering. I mean, when you when you sum up our value and our growth allocations, you get almost back to your market cap weighted. Would you get more diversification by doing 60% market cap weighted, 40% um, equal weighted, and then bring the fee bring, bring the fee down? Possibly returns as well. In the True. I mean, that's that's the. I mean, like you said, some years you some years you do, some you, years you just don't know. But but when you take sixty percent passive, and then you have twenty percent active or twenty percent value and twenty percent um, growth, at the end of the day, at least concentration to those top seven names, you come up. You're only two hundred basis points below. So I don't know how much risk mitigation we've done by by taking the the satelliting value and growth. Phineas, I seem to recall you quoting, and it may be my imagination, what the returns were for the S&P 500 and the equal weighted S&P 500 in the month of August. Excuse me. Yeah, month of August. Or maybe you quoted something for September year to date. Uh, I don't. So year to date, it would certainly be the market cap weight would be higher. Yeah. I don't have those numbers on. I mean, we can look at the S&P. We have that. I don't know what the equal weight is, though, for the month of August. Yeah, I want to say the equal weighted is like five percent, whereas the S P, the nominal S and P five hundred, is substantially, substantially above that. It's been a very interesting year because so much of the performance has really been concentrated. Right. Discount because it's, it's, it's especially in the first, the first quarter. First quarter, those companies, I think, those nine companies represented. 91% of the 7.5% right. return for the first quarter, and it's broadened out since then. Right. But it's still not. This year would be a big dis uh, dispersion year. Yeah. In other words, being in the wrong place in the wrong time could be very painful. Well, right. I mean, it certainly is it's a, an it's a decision to make. I mean, it's, you know, this is an active decision. Even if it's a passive investment, it's right. an active decision. Right. To be different than kind of with the broad well, market. you would then be a hundred percent passive. You would save, you would save um, fees, but you will always be either over or under based on your allocation to the equal weight as opposed to the. And this year, I think the, it's the market cap benchmark. And this year, I think it's uh, eight to ten percent significant under, right? To be equal. Yeah. It's hard to make that up in fees. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not. I, I don't disagree. I'm just. Again, from a concentration perspective, yeah. this is one way of mitigating. And what we've done, um, it does doesn't mitigate our exposure to the concentration risk. Right. So. 
Any questions on that? I mean, I, ultimately, we continue to recommend investing the way we're investing. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, but again, I think it's certainly worth yeah, paying attention and pointing out. Yeah. So, I don't think anybody's arguing for a, a, a show. No, I, I just think it's very interesting. Just, to just, I just, just wanted to see. see. Yeah. Can you try? Sorry. And maybe just to put a final point on that, what the tricky part is if you manage the concentration risk, you're then taking a lot of basis risk relative to the benchmark. Right. Correct. Sure. And I don't, you know, so you could be thoughtful from a risk management perspective and underperform. I, again, I, I mean, as somebody who spends more than half their time in the active world, as we spend time in the passive world too, um, I just remind you that that tracking error is the risk that the manager gets fired because if yeah, they underperform right. for a long yeah. enough period of right. time they get fired tracking yeah. error i mean yes we, we can we can look at some there permanent loss of capital is what you're trying to protect against yeah yeah, yeah. That's good. and and when you have this concentration in seven names um and when you break it up you know the way we're managing that risk is not really managing that concentration risk and of course you know this is this is a piece of our overall portfolio. It's a piece of our overall equity portfolio. It's a piece of our overall U.S. equity portfolio. Again, you know, I guess it's in the IPS. But ultimately, our goal, yes, it's we want to prevent against um, loss. But in everything, we need to hit our bogey over a long period of time. And so, we, you know, we kind of want to make sure that we have exposure to these areas. Sure. And it's certainly, I mean, it's a very different discussion saying let's put the whole St. Louis County portfolio in these seven names. But, but obviously, you know, again, but if we want to think about it, we want a certain exposure, and we model this every year that we've been talking about, you know, to the what kind of broad U.S. equity market, these names are a big part of that. So we want to, you know, have, making sure we have that exposure there is, is very important. Again, I just reference you back to, I mean, and it's, and it's not as though they're a big part of it, but they're, they're standing still. It's not as though it's, they've achieved number one or two position and they they, they plateau out that is self-correcting if somebody else begins out perform that, that is self correcting I, I only raised the issue because it's the sector that you have rated as overvalued and so i was trying to figure out is there a way we can mitigate some of that overvalued risk and i'm not sure what we're doing is necessarily mitigates that risk it just it it it, it breaks it up and brings it back together Great. To the to the extent to the extent that these seven are leading to your your assessment that large cap is overvalued, um, I'm trying to figure out okay is there something we should be doing to mitigate that risk to, to allocating to an overvalued sector. Brian, you're using uh, the word overvalued. overvalued I'm, using, over I'm using their word. Okay. You're talking overvalued or overweight? So no, overvalued. So yeah, from a relative from uh, a price standpoint, we do believe, continue to believe that kind of large cap relative is is um, is pricey, is expensive, is frothy. Um, but again, like everybody else, we don't know exactly when that's going to turn. Having that exposure is there. I think you know we we like the ability. We're mostly passive in our portfolio, so we're taking the market exposure, but we do add the active wings on the side because we think that does help underweight some of these areas that are the richest. I mean, we're not, I wouldn't say hugely underweight those top seven, but we're somewhat right. underweight those uh, top seven. And so kind of having that active manager perspective helps. That's what they're being paid for. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep belaboring this point, but I did appreciate on page three, your total exposure you know, the, these seven names are 6.9% of the portfolio, but when you even look a little bit closer, so two names equal 3.3% or have a 3.3% weighting in the portfolio. And so just at a high level, so one said two, two positions in the portfolio make up 3.5% of the portfolio. Is that proven? Is that, and I don't know the answer. I'm just saying that to me, that's a, 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 I think a point of interest that we should at least be attentive to, and I appreciate you calling it out. To me, that's significant, right? I don't know what to do about it because not having exposure also creates risk, but that, that, that's, a, yeah. that's a big position, you know, for a pension plan to have. But again, not having that exposure creates yeah. just also uh, it's an opportunity cost as it turns out. 
So if you could just make sure nothing happens to Apple and Microsoft. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think, no, it, it's, I mean, right, these, these are two, these are kind of large positions, but again, this is, um, you know, we're not necessarily making, the marketplace is kind of making the decisions sure. about how big they should be relative to, to the other companies out there. I think it, from a pension plan's perspective, you know, two, three percent, certainly, I, I don't think that's overly, um, you know, something that's going to take down the pension plan, but it also helps who the companies are. Apple and Microsoft are two of the most well-capitalized companies in the entire world. And so this isn't necessarily, you know, a, you know, a startup early that we're, that we're moving all our chips into to you know, kind of really take off the bus. But kind of, again, very well capitalized, very well seasoned, attentive to the opportunity cost of not being in there. Um, certainly, if, if you took a 10 year period and the equal weighted S&P 500 outperformed the nominal S&P 500, then you come to perhaps a different position that we ought to do something a little bit more elegant than what we're doing. But you can't come up with that 10 year or that eight or 10 year period where that is actually the case. So the market is money. You participated in it. And the guys who are big are big for a reason. It's, it's not as though it's, they may be overvalued at any point in time, but they are where they are for a reason. 2001 would argue that sometimes the market gets a little oh, yeah. off kilter. Yeah, that was that was a disaster. It was a catastrophe. Yeah. Everything went down. Look, value stocks are very well in 2001, if you recall. You made good money in 2000, right? And money in 2002, it's 2003, right. where no, in the year 2000, value stocks made 2001, a lot of money. 2000, 2001, they made good money, not a lot, but good money. It was in 2002 that everything crashed. Recovered in 2003. Yep. But, but you know, you, you, you look at uh, Facebook or Meta, they were down over 50% last year. One year they were down over 50%. This year they've more than doubled. So, what is overvalued at one point in time can turn around very quickly. And if we had a, an, an equal weighted portfolio, we would certainly be underweight. We would have been appropriate. Well, we wouldn't have gone down as much last year with Meta. We also wouldn't be up much more than we went down this year. I guess I would argue what took these and other growth names down in 2022 was rising interest rates yep. and long duration equities, right? right? Same thing that happened to long duration bonds. Yep. And, and then you go through 2023. And there was a, there, we, we now are talking about growth and inflation until two weeks ago. And now we're seeing, you know, the, and, and I'm not, I mean, started to see equities pull back, but not to the extent they did last year. And, and so we've got similar, there's, there's a similar, similar conditions to what were prevalent and cost us a lot of money last year. I'm gonna add another expectation in 2020. To the market crash. There was an expectation that the economy itself would veer off, go off the rails, and that didn't happen. No. And that's why it recovered so well in 2023, because interest rates now are much higher than they were in 2022, and the market hasn't traded right. as it did last year. And it was it was because of the outperformance by the economy. These were the expectations for the economy. We're just having fun. <laughs> no, it's good to know what we're exposed to. And again, I think going back to kind of the modeling exercise that we do, everything has its role in the portfolio. Uh, if there's no other questions on that, so and then this one again, this is the the bigger book. I'm not gonna. There's a lot of data in here. Not we're not gonna necessarily go through all the pages, but I do want to explain what we're looking at. Um, but this is again, this is we, we do this annually at ACG, and we present this annually to this board. Again, we call it our active passive review, but what we're doing is we're looking at kind of data throughout the industry. And really this helps set our expectation as we think about asset allocation, or I should say from asset allocation to manager implementation, where and how should we think about incorporating active management? Where does it make sense? Um, so that's kind of what we have here. And so there's, again, a good amount of stuff, and I want to take us through this, but in tab one, page five, just quickly what this is, 
And I was going to just start with the background up top and then we're going to kind of dive into some of this. But so what we do, kind of our biggest data, um, the data provider we use, really is probably one of the most prominent in the industry is Investment Alliance. The Investment Alliance, pretty much all managers, active and passive, this is where they report their data to. And then people like myself and you know, managers pay for subscriptions and we're able to kind of dissect and get all this data. And so there's over 41,000 investment strategies within Investment Alliance. And this is really just centered on public equities, public fixed income. So it doesn't incorporate, uh, 41,000 doesn't incorporate private equity, real estate hedge funds. This is kind of public asset classes. And so this is the data that we are using. And they report what their fees are, what their performance are. And so we can look at gross of fees, net of fees, everything. Um, and so again, what we're trying to look at here is for each different asset class is um, look at them respective to their respective benchmarks and kind of how all the managers rank within uh, within these different asset classes. Again, what we're trying to do is just see, does typically this active management pay off? You know, obviously we know we're paying fees in this space. Does the returns typically pay off um, for managers? And um, is, as we talk a lot about it here, things can be time period specific. So we're gonna talk a lot about what the median manager in each asset class does. We're also, we're going to use a lot of rolling periods. We're going to use a lot of rolling three-year periods. When I say rolling three years, that basically means every quarter end, you know, January or December 31st of 22, we're going to look back what the three-year performance was. And then March 31st of 23, we're going to look back what that three-year performance was and so on and so forth. So again, it's kind of this evolving picture, not one static period of time. Um, so again, I'll explain all this, but that kind of really is the high level. I want you to know, again, there's a lot of data, 41,000 different managers, kind of, you know, 10 to 15,000 different investment management firms uh, reporting all their information. here. And we're going to look at this a couple different ways. Um, and so again, maybe flip to page six just to kind of dive right into it. And so what this is showing you, for each of these, I'm going to start on the left-hand side of the page. Those 41,000 strategies fall off into kind of basically several of these different asset classes. Within US large cap, there's managers that are core. So again, they're just, you know, they're not growth or value, they're in between. There's large cap growth managers, there's large cap value managers. There's managers who identify, identify themselves as SMID, so kind of the small and mid cap together. There's core, there's growth, there's value. There's US small cap, core growth value. We have with international, Again, core growth value, also international small cap, which we do have exposure to. We have emerging markets, and those are all kind of lumped together, and then within fixed income. So what this is saying, this, is, this one is time period specific. This is not a rolling. What we are looking at is in each of these different asset classes, all those 41,000 different managers, we assign them, and for each asset class, we rank them, right? Percentiles, which we do every quarter. One is the best, 100 is the worst. This is the median manager in each asset class. So the 50th, half manager did better, half did worse. Net of their fees that they report, how do they do relative to their specific benchmarks? And so what you can see, and you know, this is obviously red, we're highlighting, they underperform, green, they outperform. Again, this is the median manager. So half did better, half did worse. And so what you can see over a shorter period of time, Particularly with international, it was a struggle. The more than half the managers underperformed for the year 2022. And then a kind of few growth certainly kind of took a hit. And I would argue it's probably not surprising than large cap growth, uh, smith cap growth, small cap. Again, yeah, kind of we talked about with Jenison last year, kind of overweight some of these high growth managers that sold off. Looking at the three and five year, kind of what do we see? Longer period of time, much more green on this page. Now we talk a lot about this. U.S. large cap is one of the most efficient asset classes out there. What do we mean by efficient? There are a ton of eyeballs on it. Everyone in their, you know, brother has, has analysts dedicated to Apple, to NVIDIA. It's hard to get an information advantage there. So we actually see that's always tend to be the hardest place to add value after feeds. But as you get in the more inefficient spaces, small caps, mid cap, international, you can see again, in most of these areas, more than half of these managers did outperform Net of their investment fees. Again, this is time period specific. We'll get into some more rolling stuff, but over the three and five year period. Does this page make sense? 
So one thing that we also think is important is not just um, you, know, you kind of think about it. I was trying to use a baseball analogy with this, like you know, there's you know uh, magnitude and consistency, right? So it's kind of like that OPS slugging plus on base percentage. But that's you know a little bit what we're trying to get to too. So so page six that we talked about, it's not just did they outperform yes or no, but look at some of those magnitudes, right? Particularly within small cap, small cap growth, the median manager was up 3.6% per year over the last three years. You can see international, sometimes almost half a percent. So, you know, SMID cap, you know, kind of one to 2%. So that's magnitude, but what's consistency? And so what that's what we're looking at here at page seven. Again, we dissect all the data, and this is for those, again, that static period of time ending 2022, but what percent of the time, what percent of the months, over the one year, the three year, the five year, did the median manager outperform its benchmark net of fees? So in other words, I'll start with the first large cap core over the last three years. So what is that? 48 months, uh, that did 36 months. I do the math right. 42% of those months, the median manager outperformed its benchmark. The other, the other part, it didn't. Conversely, on the large cap value side, the median manager outperformed the benchmark 77% of the time. That is this. So again, this goes to consistency. It's not just magnitude, but how often. And again, look at some of these strong numbers, particularly in SMID cap, small cap in the 80s, 90s percent, SMID cap 60s, 70s. And you can see here with international closer to 60% of the time. So again, that's that consistency of outperformance. Fixed income, obviously, but very much we're looking kind of you know high 70s and not 80s and 90s. Does that make sense? So this is where page eight and nine. This is basically the same thing I just showed you, except this is where we incorporate rolling three years. So now, instead of looking just at the since 2022, and it's it's kind of at the very bottom of these pages, and you can see the disclaimer. But we go back to 1994. That's where we have the most data from. So that's almost 30 years. And what we do is we look at every rolling three-year period over that almost 30 years. So every quarter we reset that. I already messed up on the month, so I'm not going to do the math how many periods that is, but it's, but it's quite a bit. And then this is what the average median is over that time period. And we're showing both gross and net. So, for instance, for example, the average since 1994 three year outperformance of large cap core on the left, gross of fees is 40 basis points. Net of fees is actually down 10 basis points. Okay. And what you can see is you look kind of across the page. These numbers tend to go up. So similarly, kind of what we've talked about, and again, this is the median manager. So half did better, half did worse. So we have a gross, but obviously we want to focus on net, right? I and mean, that's what we're talking about, active management. How are you doing net of your fees? And so, for instance, in the kind of, you know, I won't go through every line, but you can see it. You know, SMID cap core, you know, where you have exposure on average. The median manager outperforms by 80 basis points per year, per year, net of fees, right? And so you can see kind of, again, as we get more inefficient up to the right, you can see those numbers kind of pick up a little bit. And, you know, for most of the SMID cap, uh, non-US, we're somewhere between kind of right just under a percent to a percent and a half, kind of even over 2%. Again, this is the average manager net of fees. Um, if that makes sense, okay. Page nine, similar thing, but again, consistency. How, what, what, what percentage of that time did they outperform? And so this is actually what we're looking. Um, the so the median manager did their what? How what percent the median manager? Their three year return outperformed the benchmark. And again, we have gross and net. And so, again, this is, and this is, I, we switched some colors. Sorry for the confusion, but this page is the lighter blue that's net. 
So again, for instance, we can go, you know, large cap core on AV, or I should say, over this whole time period, 40% of the three year observations the large cap core manager outperformed that. 60% of 10. But then kind of look again as you get more of these inefficient spaces, small cap, 69, 59, 65. You get the small cap, 79, 76, 73, 88% non US core. Again, the percent of the times the median manager outperformed on a three year basis. Yep. So, again, this is when we talk about this, kind of why this is so important to us, it's basically stacking the odds. Right? I mean, you kind of another way what you're saying is if I know nothing about a manager and I'm looking at non US core, and I just, you know, frankly, I could, if I threw a dart, there's an 88% chance there's going to be outperformance net of fees over a three year period. And that's how you can kind of look at all these different ones. And looking at the outperformance, is, are we comparing this to an index? We're outperforming an index or we're outperforming a passive approach? So, the, oh, so great question. All of these are relative to a specific index. Index. Okay. So the index does not have fees associated. Okay. So and, how does and that. The analysis the index doesn't have fees associated. Okay. But if you need to buy an index fund, then yeah. there is a fee. So, so we're looking at the performance of of active management. Yes. You know, 50% better, 50% worse in the median for the active the median, managers. Yeah. yeah. What what does this tell me about comparing the active management to the passive management? The best way I'm sorry can, if that's a no, stupid no, question. No, it's a great that's question. Good. That's why we so, have to do this. Okay. This the best way to think about it. So this is verse an index. Mm -hmm. And so again, with index, there's no fees associated. Mm -hmm. For pretty much all of these asset classes, we could invest in a passive index, but there would be a cost to that. Mm -hmm. And within the you know the US large cap space, for instance, it's very low. It's you know one we we get for one basis point, one, two basis points. You get to small cap and fees go up a little bit. You get to international and it grows by Quite a bit, you know, particularly let me you know, depends if we want to use an ETF, um, passive mutual fund, but these these could be tens of basis points. So in fact, it um, by showing versus a benchmark, this actually makes it harder for active management to outperform, which versus what you would actually be able to invest in passively. Does that make sense? Because of the fees. Because of the fees. Yeah. So, so just like the the benefit of active management goes yeah. up as you move across the page, right, right. that's just the benchmark. The fees associated with the passive funds, in general, tend to skew get higher as you go from left to right across the page. Also, so. okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, I think you guys you get the point. But the, the one thing I want to show on the next page. <laughs> Um, and then I'll kind of stop and just explain what the rest is. But again, so everything I've showed you so far is median managing over the different time periods, et cetera, what, again, the, the rank, the middle of the road is. And that's very important to know. But it's also very important to have expectations about what top managers can do and bottom managers can do. And that's what we're showing on this page, is I'm incorporating, and I'll explain this graph. But again, this is basically, it's, it's the rolling three year. So going back to 94. So every, you know, quarterly period, going back to 94 for three years, what that average median manager did in light blue relative to its benchmark. The green is the top quartile, so that's 25th percentile. The dark blue is bottom quartile, that's 75th percentile. So for instance, we talk about large cap being hard to outperform, uh, active managers outperform. And we said the average excess for the median manager is about even, maybe slightly below the benchmark net of fees. Does that mean large cap active managers cannot perform? No, it means have to, have to, don't on average. And that's what you can see here. So that's kind of where, again, those green lines above the average 25th percentile manager on a three year basis, up about 2%. The bottom quartile is down to 2.5%. So a couple of things are important. You've got to know kind of what your expectation is. It's also important to know that dispersion, right? If we're signing up for active management, at some point we're going to have a bottom quartile period. Hopefully, more often than not, we're going to have a top quartile period. But we're going to experience that return dispersion over time. Right? 
And then again, the other thing to note is just again, as you continue to look to the right of the page, particularly until you get to the last four, and that's fixed income. I'll talk about it in a sec. But these other equity asset classes, those lines move up, right? So those median managers tend to be, in pretty much all cases, outperform net of fees on, on average on a rolling three-year basis relative to their benchmarks. So again, this goes to speak to why we like active managers for certain spaces. Again, we think we can add a lot of value identifying managers, but in some ways, even if we were just to somewhat blindly pick, odds are in your favor, right? The, it's because of, again, kind of the inefficiencies in the space, information advantage, experience history of managers be able to you know, add strong performance. Um, and the last thing I've talked a lot about equity, but you saw the numbers earlier on fixed income. And so that bottom, uh, those last four different fixed income asset classes, and really where our exposure is, is those first two core and core plus. That's what you see, it's a similar thing. More than half of the managers tend to outperform net of fees. But you can see that dispersion is pretty tight within fixed income, particularly within core fixed income, which listen, we would expect. You know, we, we want our managers to certainly add value above an index. Um, but listen, particularly this is kind of really the protection of our portfolio. We're not looking to take a lot of active necessarily risk there. Core plus fixed income that gets into Western, so a little bit more. Uh, we see Western certainly bounce around that top and bottom quartile. Um, but again, so, so again, so overall understanding those expectations of top and bottom quartile is important. And the fees over here for active management, Carl's. It doesn't matter because it's little fees, but they're also much lower. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, so the only thing I'll say, and happy to answer any questions, I won't necessarily take you through all this, but basically what the rest of the book is, for, and I'll just go through an example, is, is the data that's on this page. This page, so for instance, page 12. So page 12, this is U.S. large cap core. And again, this is just showing you, and this goes back to 1994. This is this rolling three-year excess return versus the S&P 500. And you can see the numbers up top. Like we said, on average, the median underperforms by 10 basis points. The 25th percentile in a three-year period outperforms by 1.8. 75th underperforms by 2.1. But there are periods where this ebbs and flows. And you can see that kind of throughout time. And we included kind of max and min for both the 25th percentile, you know, 1.25th percentile on average. You know, was was up eight and a half percent on a three-year basis versus the S and P. You know, that was a one that was really kind of coming out of you know ninety-nine, basically, as you were talking about earlier. Um, but at one, but at one point, also the twenty-fifth did underperform. Um, and then you can see, and you can kind of scroll again as you, as you go back and just both of the the less efficient asset classes. You know, for instance, page seventeen, Smith Cap eighteen. Again, you can just see over various periods of time. It does a little bit ebb and flow. So there are times when, broadly speaking, active management's more in favor. Um, but again, it kind of this is where the data set comes from and kind of goes to those top right of the information that we've kind of already shared and kind of went through. So overall, again, this data, we, we re-look at this every year. Certainly there are changes every year um in terms of kind of the data but all the kind of long period of time that you know, all you know very much tends to rhyme but ultimately particularly in the you know smaller cap of the us the international um you know continue to believe it makes sense to have active management kind of over time or net of fees uh you know continue to, to show value certainly on the fixed income side as well and, and yeah and Jody's great point too that just because it's relative to a passive benchmark it doesn't mean we can necessarily get that exact same passive exposure from that benchmark. There's fees associated with it. And sometimes for some of the other asset classes, like international small cap, there's really not even a great um, passive kind of implementation, just in terms of exposure. So I'll stop here. It's a lot of data. Um, but again, this is something we do annually. We want to share with the board annually. Any questions? In, in addition to looking at this analysis purely from a return perspective, is, is there a way to also factor in some of the risk profile of active management? And is that relevant? Where, where my mind's going with it is active managers, I think, have a little bit of a tendency as a, as a lot to do to manage downside risk a little bit better than passive. Mm -hmm. Does that matter from an evaluation perspective? Does it matter for pension investors? Who, it, it's a great question. So we certainly, you know, we always, as, as we look at, you know, particularly in our quarterly books, we have the, 
not just the volatility of our managers that we look at, the standard deviation, which is very important. You know, a lot of times you end up seeing that active managers not only are, they're, ultimately they're judged over returns over a long period of time, but most of them are able to bring in some of that volatility to the portfolio. But also though, you know, we, I'm a big fan of that up-down caption matrix, right? That's if you know, the benchmark's up 100, are you up more than that or less than that? The benchmark's more importantly down 100, are you down more, are you down less? And so we always continue to evaluate that. Um, it's a little harder thing to package like this, but it's yeah. very, very important in terms of, it's, you know, we look at active management and particularly, you know, okay, it makes sense to be active. But we look at individual managers, you know, we want, that's why the consistency is so important. We're going back to that page, right? Because again, you can load up on 100% of my, you know, portfolio into Facebook and it's going to be bad, bad, bad till one six month period, it crushes it. And then all of a sudden for the, I look great on a time series. Basis. Okay, but that's not consistency. That's not bringing in results. And so um, it's a great question. So the consistency kind of goes to it, but definitely when we evaluate individual managers for inclusion, that is a huge, huge part of it. It's not just return. Like a chip question. It, it does. I think ultimately, I guess the, the, the point is, is that making an active versus passive decision isn't 100% driven by pure performance performance results, right. but a risk aware investor might also factor in kind of the volatility metrics of right. that versus passive. Okay. Up down capture ratios as well as shark ratios. Mm -hmm. Probably other elements as well. So here does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So I take it net at this point, you're not recommending that we shift or modus operandi, so to speak, or investment strategy. No, I mean, like I said, going through this, so you look at this, okay, so we say it's, it's tougher in the, in the large cap space to add, and so kind of the bulk of our large cap assets are passively invested with online. But again, from the previous conversation we had earlier about diversification, we like having those two wing managers as well. Uh, but then kind of given what, you know, the returns we can get over time, and we have gotten over time from our managers, continue to, to like our approach elsewhere. When you look at U.S. large cap, Based on the data that I saw, and maybe I misinterpreted the data for this case, large cap value, you appear to have a better opportunity of outperforming the large cap value benchmark than you do with growth. Yeah, and I think part of that is a little bit more recently, just in terms of you know the large cap value benchmark, well, you know, more concentrated is not as concentrated as, as the rest of the growth because that's sure. you know, the conversation we had earlier. So a little bit. We kind of at the end of the day, I would come down to in, in large cap growth in particular is do you know do you own as much of the seven as the as the benchmark does? Within value, do you look at deep value versus quality value? I mean, I know Aristotle's more in the quality value um, yeah. school. Um, so we do, yeah. And so that you know, we do so very much, you know, there's not only this, but we also you know, we create we call playbooks for each individual asset class, but I think yeah. Ryan's point is there's a lot of ways to invest the value. And there's a lot of ways if you're an active manager, growth. you're trying to outperform the value benchmarks. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. And so kind of how you would approach that. And so just kind of, you know, from a deep value perspective, we're not kind of great fans yeah. of that. Um, this plan, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, so you still have one more thing for me. Oh, and that's the investment policy statement. And again, this is something annually we take a look at uh, and review. And really, the, the, there's just two updates we've added to this. The first is page four. Um, you know, first and, and foremost, you know, we do incorporate our, you know, actuarial required rate of return in this, which previously was seven and a half, is now seven and a quarter. And so part of that is just, Acknowledging that somewhat, you know, we change a little bit of the language below, but again, just to mention, kind of, you know, you know, main goal for this is obviously we want to achieve this return uh, target over a period of time, over a period of time. Again, it goes, you know, I think we didn't restate it, but back in kind of the first case, it talks about the overall goal of the plan, and that's to be kind of long term, uh, <laughs> to the beneficiaries of the portfolio, and make sure our investments are set up to hit that. You and I had a conversation about that. It seems to me what's missing in the IPS is an expression of what 
we ultimately are, are trying to achieve. Yes, we want 7.25% to meet our obligations, possibly so. But there's no expression that we ultimately want this plan, plan to be fully funded. And I have to say, I haven't seen that, of course, there aren't that many consultants in that many pension plans. So I haven't seen that in many other IPS documents. Should that not be incorporated into our IPS, fully funded within X period of time? I just throw that out there. Uh, if we're not fully funded within the next period of time, could be performance, could be that the county didn't put out enough money to uh, to allow us to be there. But that should be our overriding goal. That to me is the mission. And the 7.5, 7.25% is the annual return goal. But the 7.25% gets you, gets you to, I mean, the, the way to get to fully funded, short of performance is move the discount rate up to the level that gets you fully funded. Or increase contributions. Or increase contributions. Right? Yeah. And, and the difference between the discount rate and where the assets are at is what's driving contributions over time. Right. Um, so if you wanted to reduce contributions, you have a higher discount rate. And but if our, our target, our mission is to be fully funded. Right. And if we don't finagle, the discount rate, right? We have a realistic expectation of what um, returns could be. Let's say seven point two five. That gap expressed in dollars is what the county incrementally is what the county has to put in. Say so we want to be at ninety percent funded. I, I call ninety percent public funded. We want to be ninety percent funded in five years. And our seven point two five percent doesn't get us there in five years. So something that there's a gap there that has to be compensated for us. Right. Brian, right, your point is that if there's an expression of the full of fund status, that there's just a way to manufacture. There are things outside of the um, investment policy that drive funding status. So I don't know if having a having having that in the investment policy statement. I mean, it, it, it will be a contributor towards getting too fully funded. Yes. But we didn't we didn't vote for Prop P. I mean, why is we voted for Prop P? But I, that's that's that, that that has a bigger impact on the funding status than the investment returns. You're looking at Jerry and talk to him. Maybe this just because he laughed. The gold, <laughs> I got a giggle out of him. <laughs> the gold boy that he has in his basement along with <laughs> Senator up in, up in New Jersey. I mean, I think it think there has to be an expression of what overall this mission is to be. And that's a shared mission between the, uh, the retirement board, which is an appendage of the county, right. and, and, and the, uh, the executive or the legislative arm of the county. But we're, we're trying to deliver seven and a quarter percent returns, which, dri which, drives, the, which drives the liability. Right. So, so if you said you wanted to achieve full funding, um, that's going to be, I mean, if, if you set that, that discount rate artificially high and there's no ability for us to, I mean, if you, if you set it at 20%, gosh, we're fully, we're funded, fully funded, but there's no way we would be able to achieve that right reasonable way to be able to achieve that return. Uh, so we agree. That's why I said you can't enable what the discount rate that has to be realistic. Yes, but we have to have an expression but, of where we want to be in, in a certain period of time. The county has to have an expression. I think there's more of a, there's more of a, I would say we don't see this office as more of a county discussion than an investment discussion. That's what this is going because there are a lot of things, whether it's think about it, and there's so there's investment returns, which contributions which fit in, there's benefits that you pay out. I mean, those last two levers aren't. Sovereign in the here. I'm not saying it's not, you know. It seems like a chicken and the egg discussion, right? So if we say the reasonable level of, of our return over time is seven and a quarter percent, that's our discount rate. That drives the oh, is that the denominator. Okay. Um, if you say in addition to seven and a quarter being the, the, the target rate of return, that we want to get to 
that would mean that it would be our responsibility to get over seven and a quarter percent or someone over the full responsibility. Right. So, so, or that, that would be our part would be to, to get over the seven and a quarter. But if we think we can reasonably get over seven and a quarter percent, this rate should be higher and therefore the, the funding level would be higher. No, I think that we seven and a quarter home, that's a co responsibility, I think is what you said. You effectively said it's a co responsibility. It's well, we vote, we vote on the right, and so so we say that's a that's, that's a return that we believe we can deliver. Okay, if you also put our objective is to achieve full funding through the through the investments, that the only way to do that would be to outperform the discount rate. In which case, if we reasonably thought we this rate should be higher, and therefore the funding status would be the, the, the benefit, the benefit obligation would be lower than the funding status would be higher. Or if the county puts in more money, which it doesn't have, but I'm we're, we're talking I, it, yes, about but right, 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 right. Money. And someone would tell the county council, the only way this plan is going to be fully funded in five years, just a pick a number of years. Is that we achieve 7.25%, and you, the county, put in a $15 million. You, you, you bridge this out. You, I mean, you're doing it over 25 years and over time. Do you not think we ought to express that it is the overall mission of this plan to be fully funded? I, and this is our investment strategy to execute our part of that. I, I don't, I don't, right. I don't disagree with that. I just not sure it's appropriate in the investment policy statement. I, I think the discount rate is actually our expression because that's what drives the funding status. Uh, so it's just assuming it's changing the discount rate mentioned in the if that return target over time and then just page 15 there was we're switching sanderson to silchester and a little bit of cleanup on uh benchmarks benchmark names but otherwise everything we've kind of gone through continues to we believe makes sense to be appropriate for this plan that's why we do it every year Is this a voting item? Yeah, we need motion to approve the policy statement. Well, um, can I just make a quick comment? You know what's coming because you and I talked. So, Penny was kind enough to give me an orientation, which I desperately needed. So, thank you for that uh, coming on as a new board member. But the the we have monthly payouts of this portfolio, so there is a liquidity need in in, in the portfolio, and there's not a lot of representation of the liquidity need and profile in the policy. And I just wonder if it should be. So at least there's a way to codify and recognize that there is a constant outflow um, requiring the portfolio then to have adequate liquidity to fund those monthly payouts. And I just wondered if that should be incorporated into the policy center as well. It, it Tony, I did talk about this, and I, my comments, I mean, it's, it's, we can certainly add, I think, I would be hesitant to put a, a cap on it, like X percent of the portfolio needs to kind of, you know, be liquid within a week and then a month. Um, you know, my, my thought more we kind of talked about was, uh, you know, incorporating maybe kind of, you know, just, we talk about it a lot, but maybe just kind of formally a liquidity review of this person, you know, this is the dollars that came out this year. This was the most liquid within a, a week, a month, uh, a quarter, and a liquid, et cetera. Uh, I think even just something generic, and you just, you know, the plan needs to have adequate liquidity to fund the, you know, recurring monthly benefit payments. That alone, I actually think is potentially sufficient. It's just we're silent on that right now. Unless Jerry's going to call me out on that. I don't no, yeah, ladies are probably already doing it. So I think change in liquidity needs or funding trends will signal changes in portfolio objectives and a corresponding change in the planning horizon. It's, it's not know what you're asking. It's not quite. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think you know that there's some right. payouts. The, the county itself provides a lot of that on a monthly basis. I think of at least 50% of that. It does, yeah. We we pull some. I mean, I think what at least 50% of maybe is like more of the Total payout of the pension is provided by the county. So, 
in the rest of the Iowa line. Or the Sunday River. Um, but if, if the group of light, maybe it would make sense. So if you're on page one, so number two, if you go to B, well, this might be what you're talking about. Uh, but kind of over, so this is kind of very high level, doing a lot of stuff falls under here, but it's designed to ensure a course of action, the highest probability of delivering retiree pension benefits. Um, you know, we can include something like, you know, including, um, I think the best way to say it, but like the adequate liquidity adequate. for short term or to, to, to fund the, the current needs of the existing. Yeah, class. yeah. I think that would do it actually. I think it's a good place to add it. Brian, did you repeat that? Uh, probably not. <laughs> As policy designed to, so it, what it reads on policy design to ensure the course. Of action that has the highest probability of delivering retiree pension benefits at a reasonable overall cost to the county and its citizens, and to provide or and to ensure sufficient liquidity to meet the needs of current retire retirement benefits. Benefit it would be an even more critical statement if they have a lot of benefits. Correct. To meet current uh, current retirement benefits. So a reasonable overall cost of counting citizens to ensure sufficient liquidity to meet current retirement benefits. I, I think it, it would be Brian said a separate sentence after citizens and maybe say, you know, this includes ensuring efficient liquidity to meet. Yes, I, I was just teeing up when we the first design to ensure. Um, so design to ensure um, Probability of retirement benefits, but also you can make it a two sentences. That's fine. But I... so can just for the record, can we, we have the proposed language? You two want to work on the language, and then we can prove this at the next meeting. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, nothing is going to change. No, <laughs> no between no, operation no, of the next right, meeting, right. Yeah, operation. So if you can come up with language, Brian, that you think is. Satisfied. <laughs> 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 I do think it's an important point because for exactly what Milt said, by, by actually putting language in there, it means that we're recognizing the fact that we can't be 100 percent. So I think the addition is actually for mm -hmm. So we'll table that item for the next meeting and might benefit to have a, a chair for that. Uh, OK, so item. Nine, the drop task force update. Uh, we, the task force met in early September, and there will be a meeting scheduled for early October. Uh, essentially, we left the first meeting with uh, all task force members to complete their own individual research and bring back more information and ideas uh, to the next meeting. Um, Jerry or Karen, any, anything to add on that front? No, I didn't. No, I, it was a fascinating learning opportunity. I think everybody came, and Paul Bauer was Zoom meeting also. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to this and a lot of different lenses to what different drop structures might look like and what would be most effective. It's the police department as well as transportation, public works, and employees in St. Louis County might have a different lens. And so to understand the various versions of what might be appropriate and all should be a bit of a challenge. But, uh, with that information coming. All right. Yeah. You know. Yep. Okay. Item 10, other business. Board member suggestions, requests for future agenda items, or thanks for discussion. 
you've brought it up a couple of times, but I think being on the agenda of running for a chair would be appropriate. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. No, that's not what No, I think that. if you if you bring it forward for new business, you you rule yourself out as the oh, I say that. Yeah. I'll second. <laughs> um, I would suggest that the board send a letter to uh, Jim Kinney. Thank you, Jim, for his five years of service. It truly is service. As Jim has a number of other things he's involved in, including running the Finance Council, the Archdiocese, and prior being chair of the Investment Committee of the Archdiocese, which is even a larger pool of money than this is. Um, he has a lot on his plate, and I feel great of him to give his time to the board, which I truly appreciate. So, would, um, would you like to, okay, would you like to try? Okay, yeah. Should we write one to Emily too? I'm sorry, sir. Yes. Yeah. Send them around to everyone. You think, Greg? Item 11. Uh, Correspondence was submitted. We had three items submitted to the board. Uh, Joyce Gula uh, regarding a cost of living adjustment. Uh, Rosemary Wilson uh, regarding the retiree newsletter. And Emily Koenig's retirement board seat resignation. Can I suggest also we grab the letter to Emily? Yes. I'm sorry, is that what you said? Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. That's, That's what right. I asked. So it'll be two others. And uh, section 12, visitor comments, as in county council meetings, individual visitor comments are restricted to three minutes. If the visitor has a question or comment regarding or requiring more time, please submit the question or comment in writing to Rebecca Smale of county staff. Any speakers today? David Bilkin. Hi, my name is Dave Bilkin, I'm a county retiree. Uh, good morning, everyone. Shortly after last month's meeting, when the board voted five to two to recommend a vote for retirees in 2024, thus providing all retirees a modest relief over the past three years, Mr. Wilkins, who voted in the minority, decided the minority view should hold sway. He then proceeded to recommend to County Executive Page the nomination of Emily Pitts to the board. The County Executive decided to have Ms. Pitts replace Mr. Kinney. Who had recently become board chair after Mr. Wilkins stepped down as chair. Evidently, Mr. Wilkins' ego allows him to delude himself that only he knows what the board should do and how it should do it. Unfortunately, Mr. Wilkins' action caused Ms. Pitts, who I assume is a competent and honorable person, to suffer the humiliation and embarrassment of not being confirmed to the board. Ironically, Mr. Wilkins is completely blind to the fact that he has long since outstayed his welcome on the board and needs to move on. Mr. Kinane's term was over about a year and a half ago, but Mr. Wilkins' original term expired in 2008, and then his new expiration date was 2014. That was nine years ago. But Mr. Wilkins determines, in conjunction with Mr. Page, a person who just assumed the board chair should be replaced for an expired term of one and a half years. The board needs new blood, but it's certainly not Mr. Kinane who needed to be replaced. I'm sorry. He, Mr. Kinane got caught up in Mr. Wilkins act pettiness. Furthermore, just listening to this board discussion, Mr. Wilkins keeps bringing up this fantasy of full fund. Mr. Wilkins has been on the board for 16 years and under his leadership, these five year terms, while we're going to get to full funding, hasn't even come into significantly. The last 25 years, and you guys can check this out if you've never seen me want to. Last 25 years, at least 100 base points under just discount rate. That's the average return of this pension. You are 100 basis points in the last 25 years, 100 basis points per year 
under the discount. And the nearest decade, you were only five basis points above the discount rate, 7.25. And some of those years, that discount rate was higher than 7.25. Thank you. Any other statements? Okay. Thank you. Richard Stewart. I'm sorry. I can assure you, I mean, I wasn't in the room. I can assure you that's not what happened. I, I, I've been on a number of boards with MILT for a long time. Um, committees, we have differences of opinion all the time. Um, Jim's been on some of those committees as well. Um, we all have a, a tremendous amount of respect for each other. Um, and, and while neither one of us is, is shy about disagreeing with the other, um, we continue to be friends to this day. And so you can, I'm not gonna change your thinking on this, but I can assure you that's not what happened. What did happen? I don't know, I wasn't in the room, so I can't tell you, right? But I, I just, I've known Milt for a long time. I've known Jim for a long time. That, that's, that, that's, that's not, I just, I just, I will categorically roll that out. I mean, I, I, I yes. Just for the record, I will also like to categorically say, I did not recommend Jim to leave this. Not recommended, but not my decision. Didn't agree. So, sir, once again, you have stated things which are factually incorrect based on your own biases, not based on facts or evidence. How would you even know what would happen? He didn't recommend it. You know, he didn't recommend it. Thank you. Any other speakers? Rosemary? Mary. I'm just curious. Um, after the August 29th meeting, I know Jim wrote the letter recommending the COLA with the retirement board that passed. That letter went to the county council, but I haven't seen anything on the agenda or heard anything since then. And I'm just wondering if you know what the status of that letter is. No idea. It's but Marion, I'm the county based on prior cycles, the county's just into its budget budget process right now. And so I'm not sure you would see anything for quite a while. Because the, the, the constant um, ebb and flow of discussion between the, the county council and the county executive on the budget for next year, I don't think the budget for next year has been set for the county, and therefore I wouldn't expect to see anything. It's, okay. it's in the council's process yeah. and what they do, they have it, and it's in their process and they take it from it. And Jerry just asked to confirm that we that, that that they've received it. it. Yeah, I mean, that, that they've received it. Yes. The last time you recommended a call off. What kind of time frame passed before the council recommended? It's last year's old. Last year was a little different. Um, but it was into like probably, January. yeah, it was into the following year. Um, the yeah. time before it was pretty, pretty smooth. Yeah. You'd see it in the budget. So once they put out a budget proposal, so if you watch the committee all meetings during that period, you would see it then. Thank you. Any other speakers? I would just say, you know, my name is Joyce Kula, and I'm retired in St. Louis County. The only uh, reason I submitted that is it, it's just some research that I had done, and you're free to rip it up, read it, whatever you want to do. Um, and I guess it's all I'd like to say. I did, I did it, the date of it is November 22, with just comparing some of the other public pensions in Missouri. Thank you. All right. Item 13, the next meeting, regular board meeting, will be Thursday, October 26, 2023, uh, in person here in these chambers at 9.30 a.m., and also available via WebEx. And our last item is adjournment. You may have a motion. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Questions? Thank you. We've submitted a lot of some kind of sports and No, I mean, they won't prove it. I don't know what's going to